Um, let's slowly get started. Since yesterday I forgot to tell you about the movies, we're gonna, I'm going to tell you about them now, so I don't forget. Uh, so there are four movies today. One you can't see because it's right now, so I won't tell you about that. Uh, then at 11.15, there's something called Casimir Melovich, Breaking Free of the Earth. At uh, 1.15, there's Unraveling Schizophrenia. And at 3.30, there is Garden of the Finzi Contini's. Um, but it's also up here. You're welcome to come have a look afterwards if any of those interest you. Okay, so welcome to lecture three. Um, so today we're going to be talking about seeing the Higgs boson, um, and in particular, how we actually can see it with light. Um, just a reminder, of course, when I'm talking about light here, what I mean is photons. Um, because as we were discussing early on, um, light and photons are really two, two aspects of the same uh, force. So this is where we are. And I've put up actually two links today. Um, here is the link for yesterday's lecture. And here's actually the link for the slides I'm showing you now. Um, so what you can notice basically is the beginning of the link is all the same, right? So the part that you actually need to write down is just this last bit, which is a way it's just encoding um, the links in a very short way. And then it takes you actually to the slides. Did anyone have any trouble getting the slides from yesterday? I know a couple of people tried. Say again? Didn't look at the slides, just looked, tried, tried the movie. Yes, I heard about the movie. I heard, unfortunately, they've started charging for the movie now, yeah. unless you watch it in Italian. Um, someone managed to find it in Italian for free. Um, so sorry about that. I hadn't realized that it had changed. Um, that's a pity. We'll just pause a couple minutes here because I can see lots of people writing. Hey. And a few latecomers popping in. So. Just so you know, if you don't want to write them down and are patient to wait till the end of the course, they'll all be in the final set of slides. So that's another option. Um, of course, you need to get the last one. Otherwise, they're all missing. Yeah, really? Yes. Each lecture has a different code. Eh? Yes. That's because each lecture is, on a, is a different file. So this is simply a link to the PDF file. Um, and so each lecture will have a different code. OK. Are we ready to move on? Yeah. yeah. OK, but come see me after if you missed it. Then another slide. Um, which will actually be in all of them, is some of this I think is available on the website, but I wanted to show you here because a few people have been asking about reading material. Okay, and so here's a few different options. So the first one is actually pretty fun. I know it says it's a comic. Um, it's actually a good comic. Um, and this is actually the title from it sitting down here. Um, and so it's actually basically an explanation of the Higgs boson. It's a comic in animated form. Um, and actually quite neat and actually quite accurate. It's made by physicists. So you can have a look at that. <laughs> the second one is a site which is called Particle Adventure. It's mostly targeted towards kids, so that's the sort of tone of it. But what's nice about it is it goes through all the stuff we were talking about in lecture one, you know, about all the different particles, also talks about detectors, etc. And so even if it's d as designed at kids, there's a lot of very useful information. So that one's also um, useful. If you want to read an actual article, um, that's number three. It's called Let's Have a Coffee with the Higgs Boson. And this is actually a paper that's written, again, by physicists, but on a, trying to be on an accessible level, basically, again, explaining all the same, um, the same stuff. Then if you really want to get into it, and now we're talking about textbooks here, right? So this is a, another level. Here's two that you could think about. So one is by David Griffiths. Probably you should be able to find these in the library as well, because, um, of course, textbooks are pretty expensive. Um, and this one is very nice in particular if you want to understand the mathematics of the Higgs boson. Warning, of course, you have to learn a lot of mathematics to understand that, but at least here, that would be probably the one I would suggest for this. Another one, this is a much newer textbook. It's by a guy called Mark Thompson in the UK. Um, this provides a lot of the stuff I've been talking about, about the LHC, the accelerators, detectors, this sort of thing. And it's, I find it pretty readable. So these are two you can think about, depending on what you want. But these are all up there. You don't need to write them down. If you have those links, then you'll be able to get this, and you can have a look at any of these and see if they interest you. OK. <coughs> so let's get started with the lecture. Of course, we're going to remind a little bit about last time. We've been talking a whole bunch about the stellar model. And now it's complete. We have all the different particles. In particular, we have the quarks and the leptons. And these, of course, are two types of fermions, right? 
Then we also have the forces, and these are the ones in blue here, and these are all bosons. Now, I'm mentioning this because actually today, at least later in the lectures, we're going to talk a little bit about fermions and bosons and their spin. So it's useful to have those two terms um, in, one's, in one's mind. Yes? No, so hadrons are basically when you start combining quarks together, then you can actually make hadrons out of quarks. So it's sort of a bit like chemistry, right, where you start with the different elements and then you can combine them together to make molecules. You can do the same thing with quarks. Most of this course, we're actually not talking about those at all. Protons and neutrons, for example, those are, those are types of hadrons. <coughs> Um, but there are actually many, many more. You can make many thousands of hadrons. Um, and there's a whole field where you study them. But it's not directly, we use them as tools, but we're interested on the more fundamental level um, here. <coughs> then this slide is just reminding you a bit about the Higgs boson, which was this mathematical trick which allowed us to give particles mass and to be massless, depending on how you looked at the equations. And so this is this trick that we actually have. And then we spent a while talking about you know, what the LHC is trying to do, how you can think about it as a very powerful microscope, right? trying to actually see um, what's inside particles. We talked a bit about you know, how it works, how there are really lots of protons inside. And there are these two separate rings, which actually collide together. And we talked about the LHC. There were a few questions afterwards where people wanted to know a bit more about sort of numbers about the LHC. So I, I think you can more or less see it. This is um, a table that comes from that side at the bottom there, and there's lots more info there if you want, showing you some of the fun facts, for example, about how cold it is. We actually operated at 1.9 Kelvin. So this is minus 271.3 um, C. And so in some sense, you can think of it as the largest fridge actually in the universe um, because of the large size and the really cold temperature. And it needs to be at this temperature to get the magnets to have the power that they actually have to be able to bend these protons. That's the reason why it's um, very cold. And that's one of the technological challenges. Someone wanted to know the current. It's 0.58 amps, um, the LHC, which sounds pretty small if you think about everyday scales. Not so small if you think about the size of those protons, right? Remember how tiny they are? This is actually a very powerful thing on that sort of molecular level. But feel free to look through all of those. These are just some of the numbers. <coughs> about the LHC. Maybe one more I'll mention. How many collisions you get per second? One billion. So all the time when we're running the LHC, it really is one billion collisions of these protons every second. And last time we got as far as talking about one collision. And actually, there are a billion of them. As for why, it'll become hopefully a bit more clearer as we go through. Yes? Um, so the um, so this goes a bit more detail than we want to talk about, but it's essentially a collision is when you collide two protons together. It's not quite 180, because you, but it's almost 180. And actually, the angle at which you collide them really depends on um, how many protons will collide at each time. But this gets really quite detailed and not super important for... for yes, that's what I tried to show in this um, sketch. We have the red beam and the blue beam, and you really need to collide those protons together. You can also do fixed target experiments where you collide one beam at a target, but you don't get to such high energies because this way you get what, both the beams going at very high energy. And you can imagine this makes your total energy of the collision much um, higher. Sorry? So I would suggest you watch the, the video again, um, because actually there were two, because you can actually, you use the same feeder loop, but then you can basically inject them in opposite directions within the LHC. The, well, the one that was in the slides yesterday, which actually showed the protons, there were actually two bunches going there, and then they just got injected in opposite directions in the LHC. So you use the same loop, but you need two, two sets of beams. <coughs> So now I want to show another equation. Probably everyone's seen this equation, E equals mc squared. Um, we talked about it. It's actually a pretty deep equation because it's showing us that there is this relationship between energy and mass. And actually that energy and mass in some sense can be thought to be exactly the same thing. This is what we actually use all the time in particle physics because we have been talking about you know, making these protons very energetic this gives us lots of energy, and the reason what we want to do that 
is to make very heavy particles with high mass. So we take the energy from the protons and we actually convert it into mass. To do that, actually we do nothing, right? What happens is this is automatic because of this relationship between the two of them. If you collide them together, you can actually make heavy particles. So there's no trick to do this. This is simply comes out of the relationship that you have um, between energy um, and between mass. So I think we talked a little bit about this, but this is another view of the LHC, and this is actually what it looks like inside the tunnel. You saw it a bit in the video we watched yesterday. The video was actually an animation, right, of the tunnel. It was pretty good animation, in my opinion. This is a photo, so this is the real tunnel. And here, these are actually, these blue things, are the big magnets which bend the protons around the ring. So they're called dipoles. That's just the type of magnet that they are. And deep inside here, there are two little tubes which actually contain um, the protons. And all of this is in this 30-kilometer tunnel, um, which is under the ground um, there. <coughs> One sort of fun fact, if you actually work in the tunnel, the best way to get around is actually by bicycle. The problem is you can't actually enter the tunnel everywhere. There are actually only eight spots where you can enter you know, the 100 meters down. And then it's actually pretty far if you need to go to some specific place. So they're bikes, and you actually ride around the tunnel on a bike. Um, kind of fun. <coughs> now what you can see out here is a visualization of all the different places actually where you can go down. That's what these sort of shafts are trying to show you, is where there might be access points. And in color are the four different experiments which have been built to study these collisions. Because the point is, we don't just want to make these particles, we actually want to know what we made them. We want to study them. And so that's why we need to have these detectors, is to actually figure out what particles we've made and to actually study things about them. And so there are four of them. For the lectures that we're talking about, because we're really focused here um, on the Higgs boson, there are two that matter, which are ATLAS and CMS. Okay? And we're going to talk on the next few slides a little bit more in detail about them. The other two, which is LHCB <coughs> and ALICE, these are actually designed for some specialized um, experiments. LHCB is actually trying to understand the question about the matter, antimatter asymmetry in the universe. Anyone heard of that? Yeah, lots of people. So it's trying to actually study properties of the bee quark to see if we can learn something about that. And ALICE um, is actually trying to study what happens when we put different particles in the LHC, so not protons, but much heavier ones, to try and make a quark gluon plasma, which is this idea of having sort of freely flowing quarks and gluons in some sort of state and to study those properties. So these are the four. But for the Higgs, there are actually two. And you might kind of wonder why you have two that are trying to do the same thing. The problem is, is that the physics we're trying to do is really difficult. And we're trying to look at very, very rare processes. And so what you actually want to do is to make two independent um, tests to be able to check that no one made a mistake. And so you can't build two LHCs. It's just too expensive, not possible. But you can actually build two detectors. And they're really set up to be fully independent. So for example, it's highly confidential. For example, I work on Atlas. That's, that's my experiment. I don't get to you know, phone up my friend on CMS and say, hey, I found an interesting bump in the data. How are things looking? We actually review it all. We discuss as a collaboration. We decide what our results are. And then we compare. And this actually makes things very powerful um, to be able to be sure that we don't actually make um, any, any mistakes. So that's the, the reason why they're two, <coughs> even if they, of course, cost a significant amount of money to actually make um, two of them. So here's a picture of the two detectors. Can anyone see the slides clearly? Yeah, that's not a picture of the two detectors. Actually, these are Lego models of the two detectors. Um, if you look carefully, you can actually see it. So you can actually buy a Lego kit, which you can actually build a model of either Atlas or CMS. These are actually the real detectors. Um, this is what they look like. Have a look online. You'll probably be able to see it better. <coughs> so this is Atlas, um, and this is CMS. And over here, this is a man that size. Okay. And over here, these are people standing over there. So these are really enormous detectors. I have the dimensions written down here, so you can see. For example, Atlas is 45 meters long and 21 meters high. CMS is the small detector, 
because it's only 25 meters long and 15 meters um, high. However, if you look at the weight, you see that CMS might be small, but it's much heavier than Atlas. And this is actually reflects two different design choices that were made in the detector. There are essentially two different solutions to being able to see particles accurately, and that's how you end up with these two. Now, you read the numbers, it's, it seems big, right? But it's actually kind of when I was giving tours of Atlas, it was kind of one of my favorite things. So I tell the people, you know, Atlas is really big. They all looked at me and they all nodded their heads and said, yes, Atlas is really big. And then we go down, you know, take the lift, get there and see Atlas, and they say, wow, it's really big. So it's one of those things, if you ever get a chance to see it, it's very much worth seeing because it's something that's actually much bigger than, it, than you imagine um, to see. And pictures actually don't really give you a proper sense of scale <coughs> for it. Yes? I understand what you're saying about the two teams going to the Why do you need two detector points? You don't have one detector point, one detector point, and two detectors. Yes, so actually for the next collider that we're thinking about building, that is being discussed. Especially nowadays, you could have completely independent software. But actually, back when we started building um, these detectors, what we actually did in CMS is we made them have one really large magnet. And when we made that design choice, it wasn't obvious it was going to work. And so the actual reason, in addition to what I said, was to have a different design that we were sh sure would actually work in case the magnet actually failed. So that's the other reason, is sometimes things go wrong. Um, yeah. Of course, you try very hard not to have things go wrong in million dollar detectors. Um, and so far, we've been pretty lucky um, in terms of having really big problems go wrong. CMS did actually, their magnet was actually off a little bit last year. They had some issues with it, but they managed to sort them out um, so that they're both, um, both working. Yeah. <laughs> so it started, as I said, about 20 years um, before the start of the LHC, so actually a bit longer now, um, and with a small group of people, so sort of four or five. And so the initial ideas and the initial design was on that sort of scale. But then as time went on, <coughs> you sort of design the overall structure of the detector. You know, you decide what are the big pieces that you want. And then you have individual teams who actually work on it. And so it, it ended up, nowadays it's a collaboration of about 3,000 people on each of them. And so there'd be, you know, many people working on the design of each um, different um, component. And people from all over the world. Perhaps, I, I think it's, yeah, I think it's over 150 different countries. Um, of people who work at CERN. And that's sort of a secondary thing that doesn't always get talked about so much, is the fact that it brings people together from completely different countries. And science is something that's really great um, for that sort of thing. <laughs> Many languages. Um, so English for the physics. There's a lot of French, um, just from, for the local engineers and the local um, technicians. But actually, for a while, we had a huge number of technicians from Russia. So down in the cavern where the detectors are, we had all the science in Russian as well. Um, so we basically, we use whatever language works, um, but it can be a bit muddled, but it's okay. You can usually figure it out. <coughs> now, in terms of thinking what's inside the detector, the metaphor that I kind of like the best is to think about them like an onion, okay? And the idea of it is that these complicated detectors are made up of many different technologies. And because what you have is you have a collision right in the center, you have it really in cylindrical layers moving out. And these different layers will be designed to be able to detect different particles. Okay, and that's the basic principle. Now, we talked a bunch about all different particles, and you might think, oh, wow, I need to make 100 different detectors. I have all these different particles. Luckily, you only need to see the stable particles, because all those other interesting particles that you want to study, they disappear immediately and they give you these stable particles. So actually, there are only five, basically, that you need to look at. You need to worry about seeing electrons. You need to worry about seeing photons, protons, neutrons, and neutrinos. Neutrinos are inverted commas because anyone who's heard much about neutrinos will know that they don't interact. So we don't actually have a neutrino detector. We actually figure out neutrinos where they went using conservation of momentum. So we know, you know, we collided two protons head on, we know what we can see, and then you can figure out by saying it needs to sum up to zero what you're not seeing. 
And so these are the five that we worry about in terms of actually building um, a detector. So now what we're going to do is we're going to have a look at a slice through Atlas. So remember I showed you sort of the picture of, well, I'll show you another picture later. We're slicing it right through the middle. And where the protons are colliding is really here. Okay? And actually, of course, it's a whole big circle, but there's just a slice to make it manageable. And what's going to happen here is you're going to see what happens as various different particles pass through the detectors, what actually um, happens. And these different layers are the slices of the onion. These are all the different detectors that we actually have, and we'll talk about them um, a little bit as we kind of move on. Particles. Whoa. I didn't want the sound. <coughs> so there is the first one going through. That's actually an electron, where you see it's actually going through a tracking detector and then leaving its energy in the calorimeter. This one's a photon, which went quickly through and deposited its energy. Next one is a proton. You notice it's making a much more messy trail, and it goes further into the detector. And similarly, here comes a neutron, again, also doing the same sort of thing. So last one here, this is a muon. And a muon, remember, is the heavy brother, essentially, of the electron. He actually goes all the way through until the muon spectrometer. And finally, the one I talked about before, which is actually the neutrino, which we're not seeing whatsoever. That's what the dashed lines are actually um, meaning. So here's the same picture, now everything fixed. So we can look at it because it goes a little bit too fast, um, unfortunately. So the layers that we have is we have tracking detectors, okay, which are these ones, and then we have calorimeters, and then we have muon detectors. Okay? These are sort of the three main layers. And the idea of a tracking detector is that it tries to figure out actually this path that a particle follows. So you can see it's got a whole bunch of different layers. And what you're trying to do is basically get a dot in each layer from where the particle actually goes through it. And you imagine you have a whole long set of dots. You can join it up and actually figure out where the particle um, went. <coughs> then for a lot of today's lecture, what's going to be really important are the calorimeters. These are different. And you'll notice, for example, here, if you look at the electron, what we're trying to do in a calorimeter is not figure out you know, the dots of where the particle went. Instead, we're actually trying to make the particle lose all its energy. And that's what you're seeing in this, it's called a shower, where you see all this energy coming out, and then actually collect up all that energy together and measure it. Same idea for this one. These are just two different types of calorimeter for different types of particles. And then finally, for the muons, these are again tracking detectors. The thing about muons is they actually don't interact very much. And so what happens is they easily pass through this whole detector, this whole detector that made the protons disappear, made the neutrons disappear. The muons actually keep going. And so if you put a detector far out there, you know that all the other particles are gone. So if you see a particle there, you actually know that it's a muon. And so that's the sort of idea of trying to see these five types of particles that I told you um, about. Any questions on this? Exactly. So for each of these particles, we have algorithms that tell us the probability. For a tau, actually, it will actually lose all its energy in the calorimeters. So it's very, very rare. There's a tiny probability, very rare, that a tau will actually make it through. And so we know it's a muon by the fact that it gets all the way out there. It's more tricky in here because in this first part of the detector, you have both the tracks from the protons, you have the track from the electron, and the track from the muon, but you can distinguish by actually matching it to the outside and to do it. And so I talked about it saying each detector does something, but actually it's putting the whole information together is how you actually figure out all these different um, particles. Yeah? <coughs> it's kind of a bit historical. Um, because, of course, calorimeters have another function, right? It's trying to measure heat. Um, it's the analogy that you can kind of relate heat to energy. Um, basically trying to collect, you could have been collecting up all the heat as a measure of energy. What we actually do is very simply collect up all energy. And, for example, in the electromagnetic calorimeter, we're really trying to collect all the light. Um, this, is the, this is the idea. Yeah? So you have a billion collisions per second. Yep. How do you cope with and analyze all that data? <laughs> 
So this is not something I'm talking in detail about the so course. It could be a whole long thing. What we actually have is something called a trigger. We have all these collisions, but what we have is we have another set of detectors which are very fast. And they try to tell us, did something interesting happen or not? And so we throw out almost all the events. We only read out a small fraction of them, the ones that are interesting. Of course, this is very important because if you throw out, perhaps you make a mistake in there, they're gone. So we have to be very, very careful to make sure that we read out exactly the ones that are um, important. <coughs> so here, this is actually a picture now showing you Atlas looking from the side. So before we were looking kind of a slice through the middle of it, this is if you imagine you could kind of open it up. Again, notice the people standing here for a sense of scale. And these are all the different components. We don't need to worry about all the different components. It's just to show you a little bit how it fits together. So again, right at the middle, these are the tracking detectors. These two are the calorimeters. Then everything you see that's sort of light blue here, this is all the muon system. So Atlas is actually mostly muon system. Um, and by the way, if you actually could make a really big bag, put Atlas inside, it would float. And the reason that it would float is because a large amount of Atlas is actually open air. Um, and so if you took the total density, it's actually less than, than water, um, despite these bits that might be very heavy. Kind of, kind of funny. Of course, we can't actually put Atlas in the water. It would die. Um, not work very well. <coughs> we have problems with this. Sometimes the cavern leaks. So you have to make sure that you don't actually fry any electronics. They don't like water very much. This is um, the same sort of view, but this time of CMS. Um, I think, yeah, we have a person again for scale. <coughs> and again, here you can see it's the same idea. And basically all particle detectors, they work the same way of having tracking, calorimetry, and then muon detectors. Where they differ is in exactly how you decide to make each individual detector, right? Like what technology you might use and how much space you actually want to take up for the various detectors. And here they actually end up making quite different um, things. It's kind of funny because, as I mentioned, Atlas and CMS were quite separate, right? You know, very separate collaborations. And they optimized their detectors separately with about the same amount of money. When all, everything went together, when you actually look at sort of the performance of the detectors, they're actually almost the same. So individual components are quite different. But when you actually look at the overall performance, you actually end up very, very similar. This is a good thing. It would be very bad if one was a lot better than the other, because then, of course, they'd be doing much better, better physics. And so it shows that there are multiple ways to solve a problem. Yeah? What these um, beams traveling in opposite directions, uh, do the collisions happen right around the perimeter, or is there a mechanism that you use to ensure that the collision only happens right in the center there? So that There's very much a mechanism for that. Actually, if you had collisions everywhere, it would disrupt the beam. The beam is not, you know, if you actually hit things on it, you can deflect it. And so the way it actually works is there's two separate rings. So there are two separate tubes for each set of protons, and we have an additional set of magnets which steer the protons to collide at each of the interaction points. And there are actually eight places in the ring where we can do that. We use four of them. <coughs> the other ones are used for some specialized accelerator um, checks. More or less. So can can I? So so just to say, okay. So we're not doing a call. Okay. So the question was, okay, we have relativity, right? And so if we jump into the frame of reference of one proton, does it look like the other protons are coming at twice the speed of light? The answer is actually no. Um, and because when you actually look at the equations of relativity, you'll actually find that in whatever reference system you're in, you never actually get past the speed of light. So there's actually there's a factor which will actually correct for this. And so it will not be the case that this guy sees this guy going twice the speed of light. If he's going the speed of light, they will still see that. Now, the energy, though, is a good question. And often what I'm talking about is the energy in the center of the mass system. So what I mean is I imagine I'm sitting still at the middle of the detectors, and I see one beam coming this way and one beam coming that way. And then I add that energy together. You can also equivalently sit in one photon's system. You could sit in another, and you can do the same thing. The energy will be the same, 
because energy ends up being um, conserved. But other things like momentum, they will absolutely not be the same. And so we change reference system depending on what we actually want to do physics-wise. <coughs> OK. So now just a couple slides talking a little bit more about the two main types of detectors. So I told you there are two. One is the sort of tracking detectors. And the aim of these is to really measure the trajectories. This just means the path of any charged particle by recording the detector layers that they pass through. And so this is a little bit of a sketch. Don't worry about the details of it. But what you want to look at <coughs> is these different black curves are the different detector layers. And the little yellow dots are where particles might have actually deposited energy. And so you need to run very complex algorithms to figure out actually which paths are real particles, which might be detector noise, or which might be um, something else. And so you need to actually do this to find it. Now, the idea of a tracking detector <coughs> is really to try and disturb a particle as little as possible. What you're trying to do is to figure out its momentum, right? You're trying to figure out its path. And this you, from this, you can actually calculate its momentum. Of course, if you actually put a big brick wall in front of it, it's going to find a momentum of zero. That's not going to be very useful. And so here, you're trying to have a detector which is very lightweight, which you know, makes it interact just a little bit, enough to leave this, this energy, but not enough to really mess up where the particle um, is going. And so the technologies that are used are typically either silicon or gas. For the inner detectors, it's usually silicon. Um, because this is extremely precise. For things like the muon detectors, these are usually tubes filled with gas. These are the two technologies. And this is a little bit of a sketch showing you actually how a silicon detector might look, where you have a particle passing through. It produces all these electrons and positrons, which you collect up and read out in electronics. And here, <coughs> particle physics was really lucky to be able to profit from the boom in the in the in computing industry to be able to use this to make really powerful silicon detectors, um, which we use. The other type are these calorimeters. And these ones, you absolutely don't care about the momentum. Here, what you're trying to do is to measure the energy of the particles as accurately as possible. And so what you try and do is you actually try and make a calorimeter as heavy as possible, essentially banging it into the br brick wall, but then collecting up all the different decay products that you actually have. You sum that up and you actually know what is the total energy. The reason that's going to work is, again, because of conservation of energy. So all those little decay products, sum it up, actually tells you the original particle energy. And this is actually real pictures showing you what the calorimeters look like for ATLAS and for CMS. And you can notice that they're very different, actually. Um, ATLAS is using a liquid argon calorimeter. And so these sort of zigzags are actually the different layers of it where CMS is actually using a crystal. <coughs> and these are perhaps the two elements in which the detectors actually differ um, the most. And calorimeters are going to be very important for what we're going to talk about um, for most of the rest of the lecture. So now let's go back and talk again about colliding protons. We've talked about this a few times, but now we want to look at it a bit more. A reminder, it's absolutely nothing like colliding snooker balls. If you're thinking about it that way, that's absolutely not what's happening. A slightly more accurate picture is if you think about those quarks inside the protons, right? Which could actually collide together. But remember, we really talked about protons, that it's actually a lot more messy inside, right? Because of the strong force, we have all these quarks and gluons. And actually, it's that whole big mess that ends up colliding when we put these protons together. So they're tiny particles, but they're also pretty messy. So maybe you can think about it something like this. This is um, an artistic impression before, we, before I get to, um, which actually um, you can find online. But it really is, there's a lot of stuff actually going on. <coughs> now, it's actually pretty messy, as I said. And most of the time, this goes back to your question about the billion collisions a second, most of the time it's not very interesting. So we have some bit of the proton hits some other bit of the proton, which has a very low energy, and nothing much happens. And so those are the ones we throw out and we actually don't study at all. But just sometimes, you can get something interesting. And the reason I say sometimes is because these are all talking about probabilities, right? And so it has a very low probability. If you're after something with very low probability, you do it many times. Kind of like playing the lottery, 
right? If you have one lottery ticket, your chance of winning, pretty low. If you manage to buy a million lottery tickets, okay, it's a better chance, but you still might not win and you lose a lot of money. And this is actually the reason why we do all this work to collide so many protons at the LHC and to do it so often. It's because we're looking for something rare and otherwise we'd need to run the LHC for the age of the universe before something would happen. Yes? It's the, so the question was, do the detectors bend the protons to hit? The answer is to get the protons to hit, we use magnets. So we can't touch them, actually. Um, you would, they would, you know, if you touch them with anything, they get, they get destroyed, they're too little. But you, you actually use the magnets to, to bend them, and this is part of the whole process. You put the protons in the LHC, and then you bend them to make them actually collide um, with, each, with each other. So now I'm going to teach you a bit of um, how we actually do this, okay? So now um, this is actually showing you a little bit how we do the real things. Is we have a very neat technique of actually drawing out particle interactions. <coughs> and the building blocks that you need is you need to know what type of line I'm going to use for a different particle, okay? So for example, for the glue one, we use a sort of curly one, like kind of like curly hair. For a quark, we use a straight line. For the Higgs, it's special. We have a little dotted line. And then for the other bosons, things like the photon, the W, and the Z, we use a wavy line. By the way, these are not just pictures. In fact, I'll use them as pictures today, but they're actually mathematical equations. So if you're a physicist and you, you know, you've kind of done your PhD, you can actually draw these pictures and you can actually write down equations from them. So these are actually mathematical representations and they're called Feynman diagrams. They're named after Richard Feynman, who was a Caltech um, a physicist at Caltech, where I did my PhD. Um, and amusingly enough, they were always being called Feynman diagrams, but when he talked about them, he called them the diagram. So he refused to call them after himself. But they're extremely useful. Now, the reason I wanted to introduce these is to kind of show you what happens when protons collide. Sorry, just a reminder, we do want the phones on silent. It's OK. <laughs> um, just a reminder for anyone else who might have forgotten. I should have said at the beginning. <coughs> so when protons collide, we were talking about this messiness inside, right? They could be either quarks, they could be gluons. So there are actually more or less three things that can happen. The first one is that you have a quark and an antiquark, which will actually collide. When particle and antiparticle collide, they annihilate. And they might actually, um, ooh, I have. Ah, oh, I used the wrong diagrams. I'm very sorry. These are meant to be gluons. They're meant to be the curly hair. I will fix this in the lectures um, online. Then the second thing that can happen is two gluons will collide and produce a third gluon. Finally, you can actually have a gluon which hits a quark, and then you end up being left with a quark. Now, if you think about it, you could imagine some other combinations here, right? I just showed you three. There are actually some rules which tell you what is allowed to happen, and what is not allowed to happen, okay? And so we're not gonna go through all these different rules, but they are rules, but these are the ones that can actually mostly happen. <coughs> and so what you can actually notice here is that when you collide protons together, basically you're always going to either make a quark or a gluon. This is what it's telling you. And, but actually we want to make some more interesting things, don't we? So sometimes it can be actually a little bit more complicated. So now what I have is, again, I have, now I got my gluon correct. You have the gluon coming from one side and the gluon coming from the other side, okay? So that I've changed the orientation a little bit. And then you have this strange thing, this little triangle sitting here. What this is, is this is actually called a loop, okay? And inside this loop is a top quark. Remember the top quark? This was the very heavy quark that we had. And actually what pops out is a Higgs boson. By the way, do you remember when we were talking about Higgs decays and I told you about the fact that the Higgs can't interact with massless gluons, right? Because the Higgs is only allowed to interact with particles with mass. This is how we get around it. We use this, it's called a virtual particle because here you notice the Higgs is actually interacting with the top quark. The top quark can interact with the gluon just fine and we've managed to actually make um, a Higgs boson. Now, you notice it's more complicated than the basic diagrams that I showed you, and what that tells you is this is going to have a lower probability, right? Anytime we make it more complicated, 
it's actually going to be something that is a lot more rare to happen. And that's why it's not so easy necessarily to find a Higgs. And so this is process that we see here, the same diagram again. This is actually called gluon-gluon fusion. Makes sense. You take two gluons and you push them together. And it actually turns out to be the most probable way to make the Higgs at the LHC. So when people are talking about seeing the Higgs, this is actually how um, you make it most often. Now, yes? No. Um, you mean the protons? No. So the point is, yeah. No, it won't, because um, once you've made some other particle, it may not necessarily be subject to the strong force. So this all happens very fast, right? I'm showing you a picture and making it sound like it happens slowly. This is all instantaneous, right? If you actually watched it, you would see two gluons coming in and Higgs coming up. It just happens that this happened in between. There's no, there's no time um, that does this. And there isn't time for the strong force to, to go on that, that sort of scale. It's the top quark. Remember we had all those different types of quarks? It's the, the heavy one, the top quark. There was another question? Yes. So you actually do detect the top No. So that's, that's an excellent question, by the way, because that's actually one of the problems we had. So with the Higgs, when you do it like this, you assume that this happened, but you can't actually see it. And so people said, maybe there's something else in there. And so that's actually, by the way, that's what I work on, is making sure that it really was a top quark in there. But that's a whole long story how we do it. Now, this isn't the only way we can produce the Higgs. Remember that it can couple to all particles that have mass. So anytime you have any sort of massive boson, it can make a Higgs. Anytime you have any sort of massive fermion, so these are the quarks and the leptons, it can also make the Higgs. But the point is, you don't actually have Ws and Zs sitting inside your proton. So to be able to do this, you need to do something a bit more complicated. But these are all the different um, ways. You might wonder how many Higgses have we made. So far, it's about 5 million, actually, of them. But remember what I said about the trigger? Unfortunately, we don't actually record most of those collisions, because we can't, because they look a whole lot like some of the uninteresting collisions. So we've made lots of them. We certainly haven't detected all of them. <coughs> so now we've made them. Now we actually want to see what we can see. And this is the slide I showed you last time, where I said that the Higgs disappears immediately. Right? It's this unstable particle, decays immediately back to all these normal particles that we've been talking about in the detector. So now, it's the same picture I just showed you for making it. If you want to know how the Higgs decays, just flip it over. Right? So I just took my picture, flipped it over in the mirror, and the answer is the same. The Higgs can decay to anything with mass, so it can actually decay to all massive bosons, and it again can get decay to all massive fermions. So this would be the sort of general way you can think about it. But today I told you we were talking about light, didn't I? It can actually also decay to photons, and you shouldn't be surprised what you're seeing here. This is the same trick that I played when I wanted to make the Higgs out of gluons. Photons are massless. They can't interact directly with the Higgs, but we can put a top quark loop here again and do the same trick to be able to make it. And so it's essentially the same mechanism we use in the production that we could actually use in the decay. And so that's the full picture. So this is actually what it looks like. You have two gluons coming in, you have a top quark, you make a Higgs, you have another top quark, and then you get two photons. And these photons will actually go through the detector and you can detect them. And from this, you can actually figure out some things about the Higgs boson itself. So it's not simple, right? It's not simple to say, how do we see the Higgs? You actually need to know all this stuff to actually know how we might actually be able to see the Higgs boson. Now, I mentioned it's rare. It's actually really rare. It turns out that it's only two times out of every thousand Higgs decays that you will actually be able to make photons. But those of you who might know something about the Higgs discovery, they might remember that the photons were actually involved in that. So that's a bit surprising. It's very rare. But it turns out there are kind of two important facts. One is that the detectors are very good at seeing photons. 
and two, it's not so often that we make mistakes and think something else is a photon. So there's very little background to the search. And so it actually turns out, even though it's rare, it actually ends up being one of the most powerful <coughs> channels, which is kind of surprising. Now, photons, or light, these are neutral, right? So these have no charge, even though they carry the electromagnetic force. So thinking back to what we were talking about in our detectors, we actually only have one option for seeing them. Anyone guess what that one option is? Say again. We have to see the light. And which of our detectors can actually see light? A mirror could do it. Actually, that's a different way. The answer for what we, from the detectors, from these ones that we've built, is the calorimeters. Remember calorimeters? They measure energy of particles. And they don't care if the particle is charged or neutral. It, it actually collects them up. And so that's, that's the answer. It's the calorimeters. And in fact, the calorimeters of ATLAS and CMS were actually designed specifically with the Higgs in mind. So they were really optimized to be able to get those two photons that come from the Higgs, because this was actually one of the main goals for the LHC. And so they're really designed for that. <coughs> Now, I talked about onions. The onion is actually more complicated than I told you about. There are all these different layers within the calorimeter. So this is looking inside Atlas, just looking at the calorimeters. There are all these various different bits. Um, but the part that matters for what we're talking about is what's called the electromagnetic calorimeter. So we talked a bit about what a hadron is, right, earlier on in the, in the lecture. <coughs> And the difference between these two is that electromagnetic calorimeters, these measure very accurately electrons and photons. Hadronic calorimeters, they actually measure protons and neutrons. Okay, and there's some overlap between the two of them, but this is how you can distinguish. And you might wonder, how do we tell if we have a photon or an electron? The way you can actually tell is because the electron is charged, so it also has one of those tracks in the tracking detector. So if you find a particle just in the calorimeter, it's a photon. If you find it both in your tracking detector and in the calorimeter, then it's actually an electron. And so that's how you can tell the difference um, between the two of them. <coughs> so now to show you something, I don't know if you can see it so well, but um, it, it's to show you the idea of what we're actually trying to do. So what we need to do is to make a particle lose all its energy in the detector. Because if we make it lose all its energy, then we can calculate the total energy out of that. And it's not quite as simple as hitting a wall, right? That was a bit of a, I was giving a bit of a simplification. The way it actually works is that particles lose energy by interacting with other particles. And those can be other particles, you know, we talked about the two protons interacting. It can also, of course, be the particles in the detector because detectors are also made out of those same particles that we have. And that's, of course, how we're actually trying to do it. And so what you try to do is you try to make the calorimeter as dense as possible, which means that you can have lots of interactions. You imagine lots of atoms sitting all close together, particle coming through has a very high chance of interacting. And you want to really make them lose the energy as quickly as possible. This is a picture showing you actually a bit how it could happen. So this is for an electron entering the calorimeter. It hits something, it, oh, it has an interaction. It produces a photon and then another electron. <coughs> this photon has an interaction, makes an electron and a positron. And you just keep going here, making these various different processes that happen, these all physics processes. We can actually calculate them quite accurately until you have this huge shower of all those different particles. And these are actually what you want to read out to really sum up to the total energy of the detector. This is showing you a little bit what it looks like for CMS. You remember the crystal that I showed you? This is imagining looking along one of those crystals. And here's where the particles would come, really from the center, from the collision. And this is actually showing you that same shower, a bit more realistically how it can look like. And what you do is right at the end here, you actually just collect all the light. Because by the end, what you've actually done is you've actually made a whole bunch of photons. You collect up all those photons together, and you can actually figure out the whole total energy of the calorimeter. 
I made it sound easy, didn't I? Um, the reality is it's not easy. There are many details that I'm not talking about here. And for example, figuring out exactly how much light corresponds to exactly how much energy, this is the work of many hundreds of people. So I'm giving a sort of condensed version for how it works. Um, maybe this gentleman over here. Good question. <coughs> That's exactly the answer. So what was done basically is this depends on the energy of the electron. If an electron has more energy, it goes further. Less energy goes less. So a calculation was done as to what is the top energy that we expect for an electron, and you make the calorimeter big enough. Um, a few go out, if very rarely, and then we have special algorithms would detect when that happens. But that's something part of the design. Yes? <laughs> because it's a very, very powerful piece of light at the beginning. So um, th this would actually fry your electronics if you just sort of fire this light at it. You need to actually reduce it down to these very small amounts of light, which you can sum up. The other reason is there's a bunch of electrons too, right? And so those you can't read out. And so you need to have this to be able to actually collect it. There are other particles coming through as well. There are also the muons that are coming through, the protons and the neutrons. And so if you put many things in the way of the particles coming out, they would get fried immediately because it's actually powerful radiation we're talking about here. Particles are indeed radiation, and most electronics can't um, survive that. Yes, um, but lower energy photons because each time we have this interaction, we're, lose, we're making more photons, and they have the same sum, so they have lower energy, the individual ones. So this is a picture showing a bit more, actually, the construction of the CMS calorimeter. It's really pretty, by the way. You can see these beautiful crystals. And these crystals were extremely expensive. This, ooh, I forgot what they are. They're something very sophisticated. I need to look it up. Um, it's an alloy of a number of different elements, um, specifically chosen to be able to both be heavy and light emitting. That's why they're transparent, right? Is so that the light actually comes out. I'll double check for you. I forgot um, exactly what they, what they are. <laughs> are these crystals solid state objects or are they, do they have a limited lifespan? And what is, what is, what is the elemental content of it? So the elemental content is what I need to just double check. Okay. Um, but they are solid. They're crystals. Yeah. But they do get destroyed. So all these, as I mentioned, the particles coming out are radiation, and they interact with the material. And so at, after some point in time, the crystals actually start dying. Um, and so that's actually one of the things that's ongoing now is we're preparing to actually upgrade the detectors because the LHC is still going to run for many more, many more years. So no, they don't last forever. It's difficult. The things we're measuring, they're actually quite destructive, um, and they destroy the things that, they're, that are measuring them. OK, so we talked a bunch about detectors. This is actually what a Higgs event um, could actually look like, um, for example, in um, CMS. Here you see a whole bunch of things going on. You notice there are a whole bunch of tracks going on. But the thing you want to pay attention to are these green ones. These are actually the photons. And so what you're trying to do when you look at the event is to pick out those two very interesting photons and actually figure out that they came um, from a Higgs. CMS made the prettiest picture. Um, this is the Atlas one. Um, trying to show the same sort of thing. Here you can spot the two photons by those little deposits of energy. And actually looking at these gives you some feeling for the complexity of the algorithms you actually need to write. They're, of course, very sophisticated computer programs, which can actually distinguish this from, for example, this guy. You know? um, and there are, of course, millions of events. We're not talking about just one event. This is just one example of an interesting event. <coughs> now I want to show you a couple plots. But I want to explain for a second a bit about how the plots work. So what we're using here is we're mostly using histograms. Okay? And what this is, is we record an event. We figure out some number from it. And for each event, we make an entry in the histogram. So imagine we have one event. We figure out, OK, what is the mass of the Higgs um, from that event? And we make an entry in our histogram. The y-axis is the number of events. Right now, it's one, because we looked at just one event. Second event we end up getting a slightly different Higgs mass. We fill it in in the histogram. Third event, the same thing. Fourth event, fifth event. And that's actually what these plots mean. So when you think about these plots, 
It's really one entry per event, and you're trying to see what distribution comes when you look at very many events. So this is a real plot. This one, same idea, from Atlas. This is showing you, again, Higgs mass. Don't worry about all the details of the labels. Again, it's showing you the number of events. And you can see here we're talking about 3,000 events. And actually, it's 3,000 events per bin in this histogram. And what we're after here is that tiny little bump there. That tiny little bump there, that's actually the Higgs boson. Um, this is actually one of the plots from the discovery. <coughs> one more comment. Remember I said something about background. Now, the problem is, it would be great if we could just collect Higgs events. This would be wonderful. But the problem is, when you collide these protons together, all sorts of things happen, right? And so you have a probability of making a Higgs boson. You have a probability of a whole bunch of other things. And there's no perfect way to say, this is a Higgs boson, and this is not. We do it statistically. So we try and say, this looks like a Higgs boson, as best we can. And so what you do is, this is my same little sketch. These ones, I've now put them in gray. These are all the background events, and this is our Higgs signal. And so in this case, of course in the data, they're not labeled red and gray. They're just black, different points. And so what you need to know is how to get that signal out of all the uninteresting events. And if you compare these two plots, so this one here, you can see there's lots of gray. Here you can see there's very little gray. And what I'm trying to illustrate here is how it would be easier to figure out that you have a signal here if your gray events are fewer. This makes sense when you look at it. If it's bigger here, you can say, oh, it's much harder to actually see it compared to here. And this is the point about saying that how much background you have is very important to actually um, see it. So this is kind of fun. What this is, same plot we were just looking at, but it's actually a movie, OK? And so what's happening is the plot's going to fill in. You're going to see the data coming as the events were recorded, you know, as we were coming in data. And so you can imagine for a second being that physicist watching this and to see kind of what happens. So you notice the black points are coming in. They're going up. We're recording more data as the LHC starts colliding. And this purple is just an estimate for the background. <coughs> and you notice it keeps going up and up and up. And then finally, we get to the total data. And we actually look at it. We have a fit. Oh, wow. You notice we have a Higgs boson. Now, one interesting psychological thing you can kind of do is you can watch that plot and decide at what point would you be confident to say we can see a Higgs boson. Right? That data came in. We looked at those plots. But, and it was there, right? It was always there. But at what point are you sure that it's actually a Higgs boson and not something else? So I'll play it again and think about that and come up with your own answer for it. The answer, by the way, is we announced it on the 4th of July, 2012. And this plot actually goes up to the 9th of December. 2012, so it's actually quite a lot more data than the discovery. And actually, in physics, we have sort of statistical measures to say how likely a bump is. Okay? And we have conventions to say, you know, we've seen something or we haven't. Because the problem is, if you decide you've discovered the Higgs, and then you come back later and you say, actually, we haven't found it, people stop trusting you. So there's a very interesting balance in making sure you don't miss a discovery or that you actually claim the discovery before you actually have one. For me personally, it was actually because we had a seminar at CERN um, that day. And this was the first time I knew there were rumors about you know, CMS seeing something. But actually seeing the Atlas plot and then the CMS plot and seeing this bump at exactly the same mass between the two of them, at least for me, that was the point when I was quite sure. Because it said, oh, OK, this is pretty unlikely that we both managed to fool ourselves in exactly um, the same way. So that's it for today. I put a bonus link in here if anyone's bored. This is for people who are happy with computers and enjoy playing on computers. So I know, not for everybody. Um, but actually, we have various things online where you can actually try your hand at finding a Higgs boson. Um, so these are, again, from school lectures, um, so on that level. But it's kind of fun. You can actually play with it. So this gentleman was first.
Sure, I haven't talked much about all the computing aspects. So the first thing is, we actually have to get the event out the detector very fast. Because the problem is, while an event is in the detector,